I'm glad uh, to hear each other, hopefully again, because uh, this is the third uh, webinar of this great uh, project for the Balkans region. Uh, without further ado, I will start uh, with my presentation. Hopefully you can see it. Is it okay in presentation mode? Yes, all is good. Okay, so I will uh, talk about uh, some preliminary aspects. Uh, then uh, uh, system approaches and uh, finally uh, about a few paradigms uh, shifts. So, I think uh, all of you know mostly uh, the energy types that are available in our universe, let's say. Um, we, we can speak about uh, chemical energy, nuclear energy, kinetic energy, and so on. Then, uh, concerning the renewable energy sources, you may see here uh, uh, most of them and uh, their specific uh, usage. For example, for the geothermal uh, source, we could have a usage for power plants, heat pumps, and so on. And uh, please do not forget about uh, the, uh, our energy, the human energy, which uh, more or less uh, it is renewable, I would say. Uh, there are already some floors that uh, uh, can generate uh, energy. And uh, maybe you know already that uh, in, uh, in uh, um, Europe and uh, at the international level, there are some buildings and facilities that use already the human energy. For example, you have to ride a bike in order to illuminate uh, a room that you use. Okay, uh, given that, uh, I will highlight that uh, energy is everywhere, everything functions with energy, and of course, uh, within the circular economy, uh, we, we have to use uh, the energy for many reasons and for many uh, purposes. For example, for remanufacturing, um, upcycling, uh, green chemistry, industrial symbiosis, and so on. Concerning the perspectives of uh, energy in the circular economy, I did some researches and I found four uh, important perspectives. Uh, first of uh, all, we have the level of energy circularity in economy. You may find it at uh, system level, uh, sector level, company level, and product and uh, service level. For example, um, uh, we could use some uh, devices in order to convert the sonic energy into electricity. There are already uh, such solutions on the market. I will speak uh, also about bioeconomy. Uh, um, and uh, not get into details now. And uh, as you see here, we have a certain level of energy circularity at the moment, uh, but many things uh, should or, uh, also be done in the future. Then we can speak about the energy contribution to the circular economy. For example, in the uh, reverse logistics area, for example, uh, collecting uh, plastic waste from water uh, is done by um, uh, by kinetic energy with the uh, uh, usage of uh, air bubbles. I think you know already this solution and uh, it is very attractive and uh, green and clean. Of course, we, we may speak about uh, the energy contribution for recycling, uh, for melting uh, and so on. Then uh, there are uh, circular economy strategies uh, uh, for energy efficiency. Uh, all our products and um, even services should be uh, created, defined, uh, based on an uh, eco-design. Um, then uh, in order to spare energy, we should co-use our assets. 
we can speak about substance uh, cascading in order to uh, valorize the entire energy which is uh, uh, embodied in, uh, in the substances. And uh, last but not least, uh, we should have uh, improvements in the energy, the actual energy sector. For example, we should repurpose the old uh, equipment and components. Um, we should have already installed smart grids, um, for example, uh, and uh, we will talk uh, a little about it. Uh, there should be an automated regulation of uh, electricity. There should be multi-ways uh, flows in the energy grid and so on. I think uh, all of us know already that uh, on the market we, we can buy uh, smart appliances uh, uh, that uh, should uh, make uh, our lives better and use less energy in a smart way. And uh, I will mention also, finally, the energy as a service uh, uh, paradigm, uh, which should be handled by the specialists uh, to, to manage the entire energy that we consume, produce, and um, uh, even offer. Okay, now we get to the chapter systemic approaches. Uh, as I mentioned already, uh, everything in this world functions with energy. And uh, um, given this circular perspective, I will start with this phase here, uh, with the raw materials that involve, imply um, energy in the extracting phase, transporting, processing, packing, storing phases, and so on. So, as you may see, uh, there are um, uh, energy consuming activities which we should consider. Um, then, for the eco-design phase, the researching, designing, experimenting, pre-testing phases are also consuming energy, not to mention um, about the production and distribution phase, which um, uh, involve um, manufacturing, testing, selling, distributing, and so on. In the usage phase and uh, creating the stockpiles, uh, we have some other activities which are relevant for our, for our discussion. Uh, the usage uh, itself, and then the repairing, reconditioning, moving, transferring, and uh, some other uh, important uh, aspects. Okay, and the last uh, phase is about uh, collecting waste, sorting it selectively, also transporting it, and so on. Uh, the conclusion here is that everything should uh, use energy and use energy and the, the energies uh, should be circular. Okay, now I will launch a survey. Uh, please, uh, please answer the following question. You will have uh, about one minute to answer. Please tell us which stage do you consider as being most, most important for the successful interplay between the circular economy and the energy? And select uh, not more than three answers for that. We will wait for maybe 45 more minutes, uh, seconds, and then, and then share the, the results. Okay. Uh, uh, you are the moderator. Please, please tell me when to when to finish it. No problem. I'll give it time. Okay. All right. Yeah, definitely. At, uh, ten more seconds. We do have only thirty percent people voted. We would like to have more than this. Nice. Okay. okay. 
I think we should still wait a little yeah, while. Yeah, yeah. They they are stalled. I uh -huh. So uh, yeah, we are still, still getting answers. Yeah. At least until we reach thirty. Ah, okay. <laughs> Be good. Yeah, now but we have six more. The speakers uh, do not. Uh, I, I think. No. Or at least uh, I do not answer this survey. So no, that, that is fine. I think we can now slowly close because uh, we're kind of seeing the same distribution, and that's important. So uh, we can we can end polling, and uh, you can continue with discussion, Martin. Uh, Maria, sorry. So, uh, so I think you see the results. I do not have to share them. Uh, I think that they don't. So let's uh, share them and okay. see. Yeah. So uh, these are the shared results. I think they are relevant and uh, indeed everything starts with the echo design phase. And it's important that uh, everybody realizes that. And also the recycling phase is uh, cr crucial for everything that we do in the circular economy. Okay, thank you very much for sharing uh, your opinions with us. We will move uh, forward. Uh, main principle uh, which I will highlight is uh, about uh, system thinking. Uh, we should see everything around us as a system, as a whole, and that everything is uh, interconnected, uh, interdependent, and uh, even we could see everywhere some uh, uh, patterns uh, like fractals uh, that will help us to take right decisions in order to valorize the waste that we produce and also make everything more efficient and more circular. Now I will give you some examples. Uh, I think you all uh, heard about the bioeconomy uh, it's about having a green economy based on uh, biomaterials. Uh, the um, uh, European Commission defines uh, the bioeconomy as producing uh, renewable biological resources in order to have them valorized as food, feed, and uh, let's not forget, and this is our main focus now, uh, let's not forget about bioenergy and biofuels. Of course, this economy, this paradigm should be circular and uh, green. Okay, another example is uh, about uh, this, uh, uh, this perspective, which has the industries as uh, core, um, and you see here on the left side that we have uh, the materials which with the help of new technologies should be used in a circular way and fed into the industries. And also here on the right side of the screen you see the energy um, circle which should uh, use uh, some tools, uh, new age tools like Internet of Things, blockchain, artificial intelligence, and so on. Uh, um, I will insist here that uh, everything uh, in the uh, energy sector should be as much as possible renewable. And uh, I, I think that uh, you all already heard about uh, this paradigm waste to energy meaning to convert waste to energy but from our perspective this should be the last resort so many things should be done with the materials prior to converting them to energy uh, for example by using the the, uh, the um, uh, cas cascading method and uh, hopefully that you all already heard about the power to fuel concept which is practically highlighted here within this uh, next slide so with the help of renewable energy and disruptive technologies we should decompose 
the atmosphere into uh, good uh, chemicals which should be fed back into uh, agri uh, the agriculture and uh, transportation sectors. Of course, there are some other sectors that, uh, that are relevant for our discussion, but we have here only two highlights. Uh, and uh, you see here the elements that are relevant. Uh, for example, this nitrogen is uh, relevant for the agriculture. The, the hydrogen, which is not uh, revealed here, is, uh, could be used for transportation. And on the right side of the screen, you can see here that uh, sooner or later we will have the needed technologies on the market at uh, good prices in order to be integrated in our business cycles. Then another, another perspective is about uh, this view. Uh, so we have uh, matter and energy organized in the nature in different forms for example they are included in plants they are including uh, including in ores and so on and uh, all this uh, organized matter is dispersed by our usage into the nature into our planet and the entropy increases practically we have to find a way to bring back into organized forms uh, all these uh, dispersed matter and energy. And then we will use again this uh, organized matter and energy. This, uh, this uh, slide is based on a scientific paper, so uh, it, it is, uh, from my point of view, very, very, uh, very important. It's uh, sometimes uh, forgotten. Okay, now about uh, last chapter, paradigm uh, shifts. So uh, we talked already about the importance of renewable energy, that we should valorize everything uh, that we lose from the energy perspective in uh, all phases uh, from generation to the usage itself. Then uh, Everything should be continuously improved by the help of uh, automatization, digitalization, and so on. And uh, we should not forget about the smart solutions that are already available. Uh, I mentioned about smart grids, uh, uh, including smart appliances, smart uh, meters, and uh, of course, there should be some control centers in order to automatically regulate uh, the entire uh, system of energy. Then uh, within the waste management uh, area, um, a lot of energy is consumed, but could be also produced. I think you may heard about the predictive maintenance, uh, which is very helpful, for example, for vehicles in order to keep the energy consumption low. Then uh, probably you, you heard or you already uh, uh, acknowledge that there are some uh, solutions for lighting, smart lighting by the use uh, of uh, Internet of Things. And then we will have uh, a, a more efficient energy usage. Uh, there is an, a big issue at the international le level about uh, energy assets that are old and they should be uh, reconverted, repurposed, and uh, they should have a longer life. I, I highlighted already that uh, the waste, of uh, waste to energy paradigm should be uh, facilitated as as the last resource uh, resort. Uh, we should not forget about the remote solutions. Uh, they are already spread around because of the uh, pandemic. But uh, we should uh, now realize that they are sparing a lot of uh, movement uh, movement energy. And uh, last but not least, that I. Um, uh, enumerate here is the energy as a service um, paradigm which should be 
handled by the specialists in order to our uh, to to improve our lives and to reduce uh, the energy costs okay uh, my last slide is about this um, symbiotic industrial park of uh, this company called uh, british sugar uh, uh, I, I I suggest you to to reach uh, this uh, subject on uh, internet because it is very important and uh, very insp inspirational. And uh, you may see here that this company uh, uh, realized that uh, besides the sugar uh, uh, that uh, it produced in the past, it could produce. Uh, more uh, more businesses and more uh, products to sell and they produce also electricity and you can see here in this area that uh, uh, they have here an integrated solution for um, uh, valorizing uh, uh, their uh, materials in order to produce this uh, electricity and uh, I indicate here that uh, they produce internally methane uh, steam and uh, everything uh, is converted uh, uh, into green uh, into green uh, assets I would say okay this is uh, everything from my side I wait for questions uh, if you have any I will be glad to to answer Thank you, Marianne. Uh, we have two very interesting questions from the audience. I would kindly uh, ask for uh, for, um, for for Christina and um, just let me see and Constantina just to wait a little bit more because we have another speaker from Romania that will uh, it will be interested it will be more interesting to ask both of them about the opinions and both of uh, these questions go in regards or in the direction of incineration um, what uh, and and I would leave these questions for the end Marianne, uh, from my side, thank you very much for uh, for sharing this information with us. This was uh, a nice um, overview of, of, uh, of or normative of overview of uh, what the future brings and how should we behave in regards to circular economy and integrating energy systems in them. Um, we will go down to um, to regional topics and energy systems. Uh, coming from also Romania, Greek, and and Serbia, and of course we would like to enact more discussions in our uh, remaining what is this one and a half hour maybe. Um, in regards to the question from my side, it is uh, it is directed towards the life cycle uh, to the life cycle perspective. Um, we have mentioned that eco design and also the recycling part are. Uh, the most important actually we have voted that here uh, that these two uh, steps of the life cycles are mo more important maybe than some others uh, there will be definitely a discussion if we, if we ask this question again uh, but from your perspective what would be the most important stage of the life cycle in from the romanian aspect so what are the capacities that you are more concerned of or what are the capacity that you are uh, the best at? Is it eco-design? What should you take care of first? Honestly, I think in Romania, we, we have a good situation uh, in what the eco-design is concerned. We have many inventions, innovations and so on. Uh, I see uh, some other hurdles, uh, some other blockages. Um, and uh, I will, highlight two aspects. Uh, firstly, uh, I will point to the phase of uh, reconditioning and repurposing. Um, and uh, this is because uh, everything, all the elements, uh, infrastructural elements should be integrated in a whole. We, we were speaking about the systemic uh, and system thinking and then uh, if we think about, for example, uh, photovoltaic panels and uh, electric vehicle batteries, which could have a second life and should be integrated in our entire system, 
there should be some, for example, companies to um, to repair, refurbish, and remanufacture those assets, which at this moment they are only producing waste. They are not revalorized and integrated into the energy sector. And you heard already that there are some uh, uh, so storage facilities, for example, uh, created uh, based on uh, electric vehicle batteries. Uh, so this is one aspect. The other aspect uh, is about the big picture, about our business models. We should have in the energy sector everything as a product service system. Uh, I think you know about this. So practically uh, uh, the, uh, the facilitators, the, the companies should offer both tangible products and intangible services to the customers in the energy uh, area. And uh, this is from three points of view. This is, uh, we, we have the philosophy of uh, product uh, orientation, then usage orientation and results orientation. For example, you, uh, you know the paradigm uh, paper use. You pay only what you use and then if we look to this big picture, uh, my concern in Romania, and probably this is the same in the Balkan region, is uh, about having closed loops. This, uh, uh, this involves uh, right legislation. This involves being aware that we need sm smart solutions. For example, mm -hmm. digitalization uh, software in order to make everything interconnected. Uh, we should have uh, right uh, recyclers for, uh, for, for example, photovoltaic uh, panels. Uh, and then uh, we should have, for example, power plants uh, in order to uh, produce uh, gas from energy, as I indicated in my slides. So uh, I think as a conclusion, we have right elements on the market in ending usage but they are not in a they are not circular in a circular system because of these missing uh, business models which should be backed by legislation smart solutions and everything else okay thank you very much and just to, to rephrase uh, that not that what is more important and what we have problems and troubles with it's more than we have to tap on the entire potential of three main things. Right? One is the prolongation of the life of the infrastructure for, uh, for uh, energy uh, supply and, and distribution, which is refer, refurbish, remanufacture. The second is that we should explore the options of servitization of energy, so creating from products to service. And then after that, everything is done, Try to focus and see what are the options for repurposing of these uh, of these uh, uh, either inputs in the form of batteries from automotive batteries or the outputs like the end of cycle end of life uh, infrastructure which is wind turbines as, as themselves and or solar panels etc etc. At the end, making everything as a smart grid, right? which is one of the biggest conundrum in Europe uh, itself. Yes. Right. Thank you very much, uh, Marianne. We do have a couple of more questions. Uh, we would get to them, get them, uh, get to them after our own talks. And the next, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Lydia Papadaki from Greece, uh, one of our part partners in the, the whole consortium of Circular Economy Beacons, is uh, Athens Research and Innovation Center. Lydia is their manager for Climate Cake Hub and helping us dearly uh, with the whole uh, process of creating and delivering this, this project. Uh, she will be talking about multi-level, uh, sorry, uh, she will be talking about uh, specialization, uh, smart specialization strategies um, and its, its interplay with circular economy, of course, with a focus on energy sector. 
uh, because they have worked on the research on how to combine circular economy strategy and circular economy initiatives with the European proposed uh, smart specialization strategies and what are the synergies there. Although there are many aspects of synergetic um, fields, we will focus for this webinar on only on energy. And uh, Lydia, thank you very much for, for sharing the knowledge and information with us. I'm sure there will be lovely hearing from you. Uh, 15 minutes is yours. And yeah, let, let us all enjoy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, it's Lydia Padaki, as Milan just introduced. I am a PhD student at Athens University of Economics and Business, while my background is economics. And right now I'm managing the Greek Hub, the Climate Geek Greece uh, Greek Hub. So I'm here to speak you, to talk to you about the project we were running together with CleanTech Bulgaria last year. And specifically, I will expand it and focus on the energy and the relationship with the circular economy and the smart specialization strategy. So first things first, what about this project where most of the research that will be presented later on uh, is based? Uh, it's about uh, the leader of this project was Clintech Bulgaria, who is with us today under the team of Marianne, of Mariana Hamanova. While in the Athena uh, uh, the research center, the, um, our team was le led by Professor Fivi Kunduri, with the support of Professor Elena Tsukurimi and uh, Maria Arguedo. So let's move on. Uh, yep. So why, why to, to talk about circular economy and why to combine it with smart specialization strategy? This is the first question that someone would wonder. So first of all, circular economy, as already is presented and most of you are already aware of, is a way of living, is a priority in our European Commission and is the main strategy of how we will evolve our lives and our standards in the next decades. While smart specialization strategy, on the other hand, is a tool which is based on the economies of agglomerantation and economies of scope. And it uh, can, as I will uh, present you later on, it explores all these opportunities for the different regions. So our main question here is whether, to what extent, and how these three strategies could, um, could, be, uh, could come together. So today I'm gonna focus on Greece. And uh, first things uh, that uh, we should know about Greece is uh, some main strategies that uh, encompass the energy sector. The first of them is the National Strategy on Circular Economy, which is, uh, was uh, launched in, in 2018. And it's, uh, it has seven main goals. Its goals are around ecological design as, and planning, as I was mentioned before, waste management, rational consumption models, co coordination between the different administration, raising social awareness, and of course, the monitoring of this implementation. But one of these goals specifically is the energy efficiency. So we can see clearly that in uh, uh, the national strategy on circular economy, energy efficiency is part of, is one of the seven goals. It's, so it's a big priority. At the same time, one year later, we have the national energy and climate plan, which is one of the milestones of the Greek government in terms of energy and environmental targets, which is, which is super ambitious and actually tries to expand its, um, its objectives more than the European targets. Specifically, it's, uh, uh, this plan is around three main objectives. One is about the greenhouse gas emissions, where the Greek government is committed to reduce them more than 42% compared to the emissions in 1990, which is, uh, as you can see, is um, almost uh, is 9% more than the European target. And this is only, we have only one decade to achieve this goal. It aims to increase the renewable energy sources sharing the gross final energy consumption by at least 35%, which is 3% more than the European target. And also, and this is the most, uh, uh, the, the most uh, ambitious goal of the, of the National Energy Climate Plan, is to end the use of lignite by 2028. So as you can see clearly, energy is, uh, is uh, a, main, a main part of this, uh, of this plan. And, not, and when we talk about energy here, you can see quickly the priorities. We're talking about digitizing the energy networks. We're talking about promoting electromobility, promoting new technologies, uh, coupling final sectors, strengthening energy inter, um, interconnections and speeding up the electrical interconnection of the islands. So very ambitious and very um, structural plan, plan, which you can find online as well. 
And the next step, what we expect now in the mid of 2020, is a roadmap for the post-lignit era. So exactly how all this transition will uh, uh, will be will work out, and how the trans the just just development transition master plan uh, will be presented. So yes, yes. Now there we are. So what is the smart specialization strategy? So smart specialization strategy is an is a way uh, which enables the regions to identify and develop their own competitive advantages. It's a bottom up approach. It brings together local authorities, academia, business uh, business peers, civil society, and everyone who's related to the specific uh, topic of the region, in order to implement the long term growth strategy supported by the EU funds. So, as you can see, European structural investment funds is the main source. Of, uh, of this fu funding of these uh, of these strategies, and energy in Greece specific uh, and energy in Greece is identified as one of the eight core areas, uh, core sectors where research and innovation can create competitive advantage in the economy. So energy is clearly um, is clearly demonstrated as one of the focus areas of the smart specialization strategy in Greece for the programming for period 2014 to 2020. So right now, uh, until the moment of the study, we had, which is uh, which was last year, we had 115 sectoral and 89 regional programs were running at this uh, at this period, and they're all targeted at the implementation of this strategy. So here you can see a quick overview of the sectoral and regional operational pro programs that run by this time. As you can see, uh, till to the December 2019 we had 115 circular economy related uh, programs implemented with a budget of 1.5 billion in Greece. And most of them are focusing on waste management. On the other hand, we have you, here you can see the regional operation programs where we had 89 until last year. And uh, they, um, they achieved to absorb approximately 256 million years in these six years. So again, most of them are focusing on waste management. And as you can see here, Crete region and the Aegean, the North Aegean, North Aegean and Epirus are those that they attracted most of the operational programs for the, for the last six years. Uh, there we go. Here you can see also a mapping together with the goals, the goals of circular economy and the operational programs that they run uh, in the last six years. As as you can see, those that focused on the energy efficiency which is, was one of the one of the a seven goals of the um, on the eight goals of the circular economy strategy uh they they can be represented by 13 percent of the total operational programs that run in the country so uh, clearly uh energy efficiency is not is not just a top priority we can see how it, it is actually implemented by the circular the smart specialization strategy and how actual programs have run already increased focuses on the energy efficiency. Uh, and here you can, we can see something much more clear. We, can, we have a map of the operational programs that are related to the energy transition in Greece and we, can, we have split them uh, in regions. So as you can see uh, here, it don't, we don't name of course the name of the programs, but their focus area for easiness. So as you can see in the Western Macedonia, which is this part, uh, there, uh, a cluster of bioenergy and environment activities has been developed uh, and uh, it still operates in central, in central Macedonia, which is this area. Uh, we have the reduction of generation costs with emphasis on reducing energy consumption, while uh, they also focused on reducing the environmental impact of consumption products and reduce their energy footprint. In Peloponnese, which is this green area here, they focus a lot on developing innovative methods for utilization of waste by products and residues to reduce energy consumption and compost production. While in Crete, energy efficiency was one of the core uh, priority areas for the, uh, for the operational program, programs. As for the other side of Greece, there we go, Eastern Macedonia and Thraki, they again focused on reducing the cost, uh, the disposable products, while they supported alternative uses of pri primary byproducts, including them in their energy resource. Uh, Thessaly, which is this uh, light green area here, they focused on reducing the cost of production of disposable products. Central Greece, uh, they focused on documenting the potential 
uh, utilization of biomass from various sources for energy production. So, uh, which is also again, which is highly linked not only with um, with what we're talking today. Uh, Attica, which is a small area here in Greece, uh, they focused on management exploitation of waste, trash, and residues for energy production, uh, producing high value added products. While in South Aegean, which is, which is this area, they had some small scale investments in energy production uh, units and holdings. So there we go. What are the opportunities and what are the strengths today? So first of all, we have to talk about that the regional design is based on competitive advantages and they can provide all the, uh, a long-term perspective and public-private cooperation for circular economy needs. On the other side, we have a lot of natural resources which are available in the country and they are uh, untapped in uh, secondary resources and waste. So using them as an input in the revision of the smart specialization strategy can lead to the generation of a new competitive edges, uh, new scientific skills and expertise, which uh, can be the base for the te technical trades in the future. High research skills, we have high research skills in the sector. This can be easily demonstrated by the horizon, by the number of horizon participations, where 83 Greek participation in bioenergy products, we have 356 projects on biomass in Greece and 110 in fire sustainability related research projects. And lastly, uh, last but not least, the business sector is not sufficiently incentivized and involved, which is a big opportunity in Greece for the next 10 years and the relevant strategies that are coming on how the business sector can be more engaged into all these development plans and uh, in order to actually uh, to, 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 and how we can uh, drive the investments in the areas of waste management, recycling, energy and materials efficiency. So thank you very much. I think I'm on time in Milan, right? I give yes, you back some time. To be honest, you have three more minutes, but uh, yeah, okay. would you like to emphasize something? <laughs> uh, I'm, pretty from, I'm open for questions from the public. So here you can see, you can find more. This is my email if someone wants to contact me later on for questions. And here is our site where you can find more on the specific project. A project, uh, if you if you're interested, I can share you here. You, um, if you go to SDSN, which is the Network for Sustainable Development Solutions, uh, you can find links to Climate GitHub Greece and everything else we're working on. Uh, we are basically a cluster of institutions. At this moment, I focused a lot on the Climate GitHub Greece and are all under Athena, but we're a cluster of institutions which is composed of a number of research centers and two main net networks. One of them is Climate Geek and the other is the SDSN, that's why the link. So if you have any further questions, if you want to check our reports and uh, stay updated with everything we do, uh, please check our sites. And of course the Circular Economy Beacon site, which is updating very often. So yeah, that's for my end. Thank you, Lydia. Uh, well, there, there is one polling question for the audience. Maybe we can raise this in a short discussion based on this. Um, it, is, it is structured as a how energy transition in Greece can be mobilized. But let's transfer this to all of our countries. What do you think? What is necessary? So we, we start with the energy transition either in Greece, Romania, Bulgaria, Serbia, or, or um, whatever nice country you're coming from. Uh, we would like to see your votes and to uh, see what are the perspectives. Where should we start? And while the poll is running, um, uh, there was one uh, well, one thing that caught my eye <clears throat> was that the certain regions are basically having their own priorities, and usually they're combining waste management and energy production. And uh, and in this in this uh, in this essence, a lot of this is focused on. Um, biomass and bio, bio, bioenergy production. Uh, how are these regions uh, deciding on the priorities on what programs will they take forward or what uh, will just remain as, as, as a, a paper in the drawer? Um, is this centralized and brought by the strategy for energy or for the uh, for the uh, uh, circular economy, or it is recognized by every region? What are their needs and what are their capacities? 
Oh, thank you, Milan. That was an excellent question. So basically what happened until today is that firstly, as you saw the, also the dates, the, search, the smart specialization strategy was for the programming period starting in 2014. What implements the, the, the smart specialization strategy uh, was delivered far before we talk about any circular economy. So the strengths and the competencies that are identified in the smart specialization strategy and based on which also the operational programs are fit and the calls for them were fit. Uh, happened far before we talk about the core sustainability aspects on if the, these uh, develop or, or on if these prog programs would be sustainable in the future. So what we try and we implemented to, to do here was to and that was the whole goal of this project was to bring together the smart specialization strategy and try to translate it in circular economy terms, which means that we, what we implement to do not only for this programming period, but for the next one mainly, and for the revision of the smart specialization strategy, is how to, to, to revise something that it will make sense under the European trend with the circular economy, under the, highly, the big need of sustainability, and uh, how uh, we can combine these two opportunities. So as exactly you said here, and this is something that we, uh, that we, unfortunately the biomass and how the, uh, the energy production comes from biomass wasn't the only case. And uh, here was when we talked about the operational programs, we focused mainly as you can see here, let me go above a bit. So as you can see here, we're talking about 113 interventions where, which are related to circular economy, which means that all, not all programs and not all interventions happened before that were based on the smart specialization strategy had to do anything with circular economy. So this was the way that, uh, uh, that uh, the decisions were delivered. There was a smart specialization strategy far from uh, the circular economy approaches the, then the regions were focusing on their strengths and this is the high need of, the, of today on how we will combine and how we'll make all these synergies between having biomass which is related to waste management, producing clean energy and also uh, strengthening the, the competi competitive role of the region. I hope thank I you very much. Question. Yes, you did. Yes, thank you. Well, basically, yeah, well, I don't want to be repetitive. Uh, everyone will have recordings, so uh, they will know more about if, if we listen once again. But uh, uh, that's that's one of the ways to um, push the implementation of top-down strategies into the regional, into the regional, uh, let's call it fruition. And that's why in next year, and thanks to Circular Economy Beacons and all the consortia, we will um, commence with the similar research that will be led by uh, Athens, uh, which will combine uh, smart specialization strategies, which will emphasize the learnings from this process and try to scale and upgrade as well um, this this type of research trying to uh, uh, on the whole Balkan region or actually in our selected countries <clears throat> trying to uh, utilize the potential combine and make synergies between these two strategies and basically between all the stakeholders that these two strategies should should encompass um, thank you very much Lydia for for the time and for the information and uh, this is the this is basically the power and the yeah well the power of circular economy because because we managed to combine uh, business uh, actors research and innovation actors policy actors and uh, and strong in institutions such as uh, for instance chamber of commerce as well as uh, experts knowledge from the consulting or research and innovation centers from uh, from across europe and uh, uh, learning from the successes, trying to um, almost immediately update our working plans and scale that or replicate some of the successes in some of the regions and, and in that way facilitate or catalyze implementation and move systemic move towards circular economy. So thank you, Lydia, once again. Thank you. Now I would like to introduce uh, Oh, yes, the next one on our stage will be engineer George Samargia uh, from Serbia uh, with a very interesting project, but also a very highly, um, um, 
well, agile and motivated approach towards renewable energies in Serbia, uh, mainly tackling solar solar energy. Um, he comes from uh, from Belgrade and he is coach at Climate Innovation Hub and solar investor in his very interesting project. That is, well, I will leave it to you, Georgi, to explain a little bit more about this. Um, uh, and thank, thank you, Milan. Yes, we can hear you. 15 minutes is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, okay, uh, just uh, give me a thumb if you see my screen so I can uh, continue. Uh, okay, uh, thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation and I'm very glad to participate in this uh, very well attended uh, uh, web, uh, webinar, like 50 people. It's really, it's really great and I congratulate uh, to the project team for, for bringing all these people together to discuss uh, important questions uh, uh, which relate to energy and, uh, and the circular economy. Uh, and uh, yeah, basically we have some discussion before this webinar, uh, how much energy we will need uh, in the in future circular economy. And what we what we all know is that basically, yeah, the energy uh, demand or energy use will definitely uh, grow and it will grow probably probably exponentially. So uh, before I start, uh, to, uh, to talk about specifically about, about solar, uh, I'd like to run uh, one quick poll uh, and uh, ask you uh, like very, very, I think it, it should be simple question, but uh, which kilowatt uh, hour is the cheapest one? So regarding the, uh, regarding the, uh, the generation and uh, can okay i will okay i think that now you can see the the poll so which kilowatt hour is the cheapest coal nuclear wind solar geothermal or other thank you for this uh, we do have 40 40 something participants now with us and we would like to have at least 30 answers to have some kind of raise discussion on this. So let's let's have more votes. We have uh, 20 seconds open. All right, nice. There are some very interesting uh, developments in, in the polling. <laughs> So yeah, let, let me know, Milan, can I close the poll? It's already one minute. Yeah, let's wait for a couple of more seconds. That's okay. Fine. All right. Okay. I guess uh, we're okay now. Yeah, okay. Uh, so uh, I, I'd like to share results and the comment, comment about them. Uh, yeah, we can see that the majority of uh, people put solar and basically that's something what is happening right now in uh, in the world the solar the electricity from solar uh, already uh, overcame uh, coal and nuclear in terms of, of price but what i would uh, like to 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 tell you here is basically that the cheapest kilowatt hour is one which has never been used or consumed so basically the energy efficiency is uh, something what we need to take care about and uh, to use all possible means to reduce our demand for the uh, for the for the energy and to reduce the way the waste of the energy and i believe that also uh, circular economy can play an uh, important role because we know that a lot of energy is wasted right now and maybe circular economy processes can pick up some of that energy. Otherwise, it will be very, very difficult to create the system, energy system, which will eventually uh, meet uh, future future needs. Uh, yeah, okay, just now share the results. Sorry. 
and uh, yeah, okay. I will I will uh, continue continue the, with the presentation. Uh, my name is uh, George Samarja, and uh, yeah, I don't have background in electrical engineering or energy or circular economy. I am an air traffic engineer who worked uh, 14 years for air traffic control, but in one moment of time, I decided to stop working. Uh, in in air traffic control and started my own business, which is mainly focused on uh, on uh, aviation emissions calculation and reporting. But also, uh, two years ago, I'm investing in uh, in solar energy, and also I'm a co-founder of several uh, several interesting uh, interesting uh, civil uh, civil initiatives. Why I decided uh, on uh, to to undertake uh, this. Uh, change in my career. Yeah, I have a son and uh, our world is warming. He and his generation are uh, projected to uh, live until uh, to, 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 to see how 22nd century will look like. And um, I think that, yeah, I, I need to, to, to do whatever I can to prevent uh, the warming and to make uh, uh, the future world for my son and his generation uh, livable, or at least that they have the uh, same quality of life as we have. Uh, uh, so let's see what is what is basically happening in in in, in our world. There are a lot of uh, a lot of different uh, impacts uh, by by human activities on the environment, and many of them are uh, unfortunately negative. And uh, these impacts can be uh, exp uh, can be explained by this very uh, simple uh, formula, uh, which uh, says that uh, impact is the uh, product of population affluence or wealth and technology. And what is happening basically? We know that the, the population is rising, that the wealth or affluence in the world is rising exponentially or growing. And that basically uh, means that uh, our impact is growing. And uh, I believe that many of you already heard for the term uh, Earth Overshoot Day. So basically, uh, we already consumed all resources for this year on August 22nd. And the rest of the year, we are basically borrowing from future generations. What we can do if we uh, assume that population and affluence will grow exponentially, and I hope it will, because it's nothing wrong to have more people on, on the planet and that they live better lives. We can use technology to reduce our impact. And we all, because these two, uh, two elements, population and affluence, grow exponentially, we also need some exponential technologies. Uh, the same, the same uh, uh, formula, but written in a, a slightly different way, is uh, how we can uh, basically how what is the emissions or greenhouse gas emissions in our world is also product of uh, P, which stands for population. Then we have uh, uh, GDP per capita, which also grows. So population and GDP per capita is growing. Uh, we have uh, energy intensity uh, of the GDP. So basically the, uh, the amount of energy we are uh, consuming for production of one unit of GDP. And also we have a carbon footprint of that, of that energy uh, at the end. And basically what having uh, in mind that population and uh, GDP uh, are growing, that's the reason why uh, why emissions are growing also. But what we can do, we can, uh, we can act on these two last uh, elements with uh, energy efficiency measures, so to reduce our energy intensity, and also with a low carbon energy, uh, which uh, is basically reduction of, of emissions and using uh, low carbon uh, energy sources. Uh, I already mentioned these exponential technologies, and there, there are already a lot of them around us, but uh, our brain is basically, yeah, we evolved in a, in a linear uh, environment, and we can uh, spot 
very easily this linear growth and uh, it is uh, how to say very uh, uh, we understand how how that works and uh, here you can see an example uh, when you make 30 steps in a linear growth yeah you will end like 30 meters from from here but if you undertake 30 steps growing in exponential growth yeah basically you will be able to uh, at the end to go a couple of times around around uh, planet earth and uh, you can see here all these technologies like computers networks artificial intelligence uh, vr robots uh, solar energy uh, they are all exponential technologies how they work uh, more for example more computers basically help us to create to produce more new computers better network networking network that uh, world uh, help us to uh, build more networks similar thing is with uh, solar and basically other renewables uh, because we have uh, uh, we have uh, uh, we can uh, uh, with more solar we can create more and more solar solar energy so uh, rise of, uh, we can uh, see uh, all around the world that we have uh, this increase dramatic increase of renewables why because they do not they, there is no pollution there is almost no limitation and they offer democratiz democratization and decentralization of energy uh, of energy production basically you don't need to depend on uh, some centralized energy uh, generator you can create your energy for yourself uh, many people say that it's not possible it is too expensive uh, there is no enough resources but uh, i will refer and uh, yeah advise you to to visit the solution project uh, uh, web page uh, they have uh, uh, scenarios for uh, how uh, the whole world and every country in the world can go 100% renewable using only solar, hydro, uh, wind, and uh, uh, geothermal geothermal energy. Also, uh, they have uh, some uh, uh, estimations how much uh, jobs there will be created uh, and and other benefits of uh, of going solar. You can see. Uh, from uh, this uh, uh, historic data that yeah solar is growing exponentially and uh, this these are data uh, compiled by international uh, uh, renewable energy agency uh, which deals with with all renewables and you can see that uh, that the capacity of installed solar power plants uh, in the world are going uh, is increasing uh, with this increase, we have another trend. Uh, basically, uh, with uh, every uh, increase uh, of 28% uh, uh, of uh, uh, installed capacity, uh, the price of uh, solar panels is reducing by by, by uh, is double. So you can you can see here that yeah, uh, we, economy of scale works and. Uh, as we are uh, installing more solar, it is going to be cheaper and cheaper. Uh, just one uh, optimistic uh, projection. This is my calculation uh, based on, uh, on, on a historic data. So maybe we are just at the beginning of uh, a very, very, uh, how to say, a steep solar, solar wave. Or, for example, in this case, on a on a project on a pro, on a timeline to 2050 so we are just as i said we are just in, at the beginning and there are some like, like very shocking news which uh, uh which uh, it is very important that we take uh, take note about that is that uh, the whole amount of energy we need uh, in, in our planet so to run every particular uh, system uh we get that from the sun in one hour. So for the to run uh, our economy for the entire year, we just need to collect sun energy uh, of, of one hour. So basically, we need to uh, think how we can how we can uh, uh, 
collect that energy. And yes, sun will be with us for the next 5 billion years. And that's make it uh, like an ultimate, ultimate uh, renewable resource. Uh, true potential of, of renewables, uh, you can see on this, uh, on this slide uh, with uh, orange uh, is current uh, energy, energy demand. The yellow is solar. So you can see that we have like, I don't know, 100,000 times more solar uh, potential than we eventually need. On your or, or right hand side, you can see uh, finite resources of energy, coal, uranium, petroleum, natural gas. Basically, if you try to, to compare current uh, uh, usage with these finite sources of energy, it is even wise, wise and clever to go uh, to 100% renewables, even uh, if you do not, uh, because uh, there is a finite, uh, other, other sources are, are finite. And uh, yeah, that's, that's uh, how to say, uh, uh, yeah, it's not only uh, that we need the renewables because of climate change. It is a business wise, uh, uh, wise decision. Uh, also, there are some doubts that we do not have enough uh, surface area required to power the world by solar. But basically, uh, there are some projections that uh, in 2030, we will need only uh, area uh, which is equal to Spain to cover uh, with solar panels and uh, to, to power the whole world. And basically, we have uh, like a lot of deserts all around the world and lot of uh, uh, also there there are a lot of uh, how to say uh, floating solar concepts right now so you can put it even on uh, on some lakes and and uh, and in the in the sea uh, what is the in my opinion the, the 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 killer app for energy transition is a carbon fee and dividend uh, basically uh, the reason for, for the climate change is that our market is, uh, is, is, not, uh, is favoring uh, fossil fuels. So fossil fuel industries, they don't need to pay for their uh, pollution. And uh, if you uh, put carbon fee on, uh, that, on, for that polluters and that particular types of fuel like oil, gas and coal, yeah, you can make a level playing field for renewables. And that's something what is actually uh, proposed as a part of European Green Deal, something called the Carbon Border Adjustment Mechanism. So basically all uh, uh, goods which are imported to Europe from countries which do not have climate uh, policies will be taxed uh, to, uh, to in include this debt pollution. Challenges for solar, what, uh, what, 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 what I think it needs to be uh, uh, resolved in, in near future, we, we will need a lot of material to install all these solar uh, pan, uh, panels and uh, uh, power plants. Uh, some of these uh, materials are rare and we also need to think about recycling uh, after the end of life. And in my opinion, a circular economy can play a great, great role here and support, uh, support uh, this, uh, uh, this transition because, yeah, circular economy can provide enough material for that. Uh, other, uh, other things like uh, uh, variability, uh, there it's a technical problem and it can be solved by a smart grid, uh, energy storages, or even change of... Uh, human behavior. So we will adapt our life to the part of the day when we have uh, more, more energy. Uh, I will also uh, here uh, emphasize one, uh, uh, one uh, term which is often neglected and it is energy returned on energy invested. Uh, oil, fossil fuels are good because we get a lot of energy for uh, invested energy. So basically uh, first, uh, oil uh, wells, they provided like 100 barrels of oil for one barrel of, uh, uh, of, uh, of oil invested. 
and that was uh, uh, that was uh, very uh, very good for for the development of our of our society because we had the uh, we had the very cheap energy uh, the electricity right now and the, and the energy uh, energy we will use with renewables we will need a little bit more resources uh, than, uh, than than that and uh, the last uh, the last slide uh, is uh, I will just point out some uh, uh, benefits of solar so we do not have any emissions and pollution it is infinite uh, source of energy it offers decentralization so basically everybody can produce energy which he or she or that community needs. Uh, it democratizes the, the, the energy, so it will be easily uh, accessed. Uh, cooperatives uh, are available. And uh, for example, in Serbia, uh, I am a co-founder of a second cooperative in our country. Uh, the, I saw that uh, one of the, the, the co-founder of first the cooperative is in the audience for this, for this webinar. Uh, and uh, what is also very important uh, for uh, solar is that it offers long-term fixed price of electricity, and that offers new business business possibilities. And that's something what I'm working also on. Uh, I'm in, I'm uh, designing the solar power plant, which will uh, sell the uh, electricity directly to the market without any state uh, subsidy. And uh, yeah, uh, clients will have. Uh, uh, we'll have a certain and predictable, uh, predictable price of uh, electricity forever. You can you cannot do that uh, with with fossil fuels, and we can see that it's unstable price and uh, it rises, it increases uh, all the time. Thank you very much. And uh, in case that I uh, I was a little bit longer, sorry. Thank you very much, George. It was, it was really interesting to see what are the all the international also aspects and in, uh, and in regards to solar. I would like to raise the discussion and see what are the energy communities or solar cooperatives being like in the, in Serbia. And if your colleague is still in the audience, I would also give him a floor, uh, maybe to raise this discussion. If this is going on, what are the barriers and what are basically the requirements for uh, solar cooperatives or energy cooperatives to work uh, in Serbia, most probably similarly to in the region? Uh, yeah, th th thank you very much for, for this question. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, like the no brainer answer on this question is like regulation. Okay, we don't need, we don't have regulation for that. And that's basically true because uh, in Serbia, we do not. We have a law on cooperatives, but we do not have a law. It, it's not about energy cooperatives. So we we co -fo we founded a, a cooperative with one uh, uh, with the mission to allow everybody to enter uh, climate climate action. Many people want to undertake something to and to to do something good for climate. But it is sometimes it's too pricey. If many of people want to install solar panels, but uh, sometimes it is too pricey. Through cooperative, you can basically do crowdfunding and allow many people to uh, jointly invest in one or more solar power, power plants. Another thing which we are solving with this uh, with this cooperative is that uh, in Serbia. Uh, Households or people cannot issue the invoice. And basically, if you have uh, more uh, electricity, you want to sell it to the market. But being a natural person or a household, you are not allowed that. And uh, yeah, what you can do, you can try to change the law. And that's not something what is uh, what is easy to it is e easy to say than than to to be done. So what was our approach? We will navigate through existing to existing regulation and find the legal way how we will do that. And that's how that's uh, how cooperative was uh, uh, was created. So basically, uh, in our in our case, if you are household and you have a, a solar power plant, 
you can uh, invoice the access of uh, your electricity through cooperative and then cooperative will uh, return you your money since you are you are the member so yeah regulation is the the problem but uh, it is solvable if you make a good analysis and find uh, find a way how to navigate and i would but i would say that the biggest problem is that government is subsidizing coal and the coal electricity is very cheap and in, in current moment uh it it is like the cheapest way and people they just don't want to pay a higher price of electricity uh on another way uh this coal makes us sick even kills us and we need to find a way how to how to resolve uh, current uh, current issues with our air quality uh and uh, to help government to decide to shut down all coal power plants in in the near n near future uh, you mean coal power plants hydro coal power, power plants coal, yeah, coal, coal power plants, sorry <laughs> All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and, and, and just to succinctly conclude that I see that there are two main hurdles that are basically rem rem remnants of the of also the previous times. And if you talk about uh, energy, there is a, a energy structure as well, energy governance, uh, which may differ from country to country. Um, which also has to be changed in order to open the doors for, for this kind of cent decentralized energy uh, supply. And there are two main issues that, uh, that are now not blocking, but uh, posing as various laws and, and old fashioned policies. Um, these are the trends are that these, especially the policies that are favoring fossils are, are um, starting to be demotivated or defaced um, and there is a there is a tendency that uh, the trends will follow also in this region it's upon the actors from the bottom-up uh, part to push and, and and see what are the options and what are the strengths and opportunities also as you saw uh, to help policymakers uh, bridge these these gaps and uh, find the solemn solution for transition towards more more renewable source sources mm. I know that the, our Greek colleagues also have uh, several uh, initiatives in regards to decentralized uh, energy production. Um, I would leave this to for some next discussion because we don't have too much time, but this is happening and maybe uh, a couple of contexts should be shared after the webinar in order to uh, catalyze and improve the development of these, these topics. So, Thank you very much. Thank you, Georgia, uh, for the time. And the least, but not the last, least, sometimes that happens also. Um, I would, uh, I would like to introduce uh, Kathleen Chis, energy consultant. Kiss, maybe that I pronounced it wrongly. It's Sorry okay. for that. It's okay. That's good. Energy consultant from Timish County Energy Management Association, uh, coming from Romania. And he will uh, let us know a bit more about multi-level scenarios and uh, interconnecting energy with modules of the circular economy. So uh, talking more about uh, various implications of various levels of systems, then, uh, well, systems in energy and their implications in circular economy. Catalin, uh, the time is yours, floor is yours. Uh, and yeah, let's join next 15 Thank minutes. you, Milan. Uh, so good day to everyone. Uh, many thanks to the, to the speakers uh, before me. We, I think that uh, we gain a lot of, uh, of expertise. Um, there are not many things left to be said. So uh, basically I will try to be short and uh, I'll try to come down to some kind two specific examples of actually how can we connect my main field energy with uh, with the with the circular economy um, so 
the very long title will be multi-level scenarios of interconnecting energy with the modules of circular economy. Um, I'm basically an energy consultant for almost uh, 15 years. Main main uh, directions energy trading uh, for seven or eight years when the renewables starting to come in East Europe, also renewables. And in the last three or four years, uh, um, the Timish County Energy Management Association, where I'm an active member, we are starting to be active um, regarding European funding energy projects for, uh, for Romania. So, as I said, uh, we will talk about the context that we, we are finding ourselves, um, the two main goals that I think that should be reached through uh, the circular economy principles. And as I said, two short examples of uh, how I see the, the uh, interconnectedness between energy and uh, circular economy. Um, this year we had uh, we had from the resource point of view a very bad year uh, the overshoot day 2020 was actually one and a half months before there was the overshoot day 2019 although everybody was thinking that due to the coronavirus and due to the decreasing of um, of um, economical activity the overshoot day will be somewhere in november uh, the calculation made that the overshoot day this year was on the what, at noon uh, on the 22nd of August uh, 2020, and we have uh, we have um, a couple of uh, very interesting examples. Like for example, the worst case or the worst case, if I can put it like that, was Luxembourg, who reached the overshoot day already in uh, the. Um, the 11th of, uh, of February. Romania is somewhere uh, below the average because we are not performing very well. Um, Indonesia, for example, is the best uh, the best from this um, from this index uh, because um, as we know, the economical activity comparing with the Europe and Western countries is not as intensive as it is for example, for us. So that's one, one of the main uh, concern that uh, should be at the base of, uh, of convincing people to take it more seriously, the, the circular economy. Um, also, the, I, was, uh, I pay very attention to a study made by, uh, by Chicago University, who said that uh, um, worldwide the pollution is the most, uh, is the worst killer and one of the hidden killer because you don't see the effects uh, when, it's, when it's already two months. So um, somewhere around there, there is the, at the bottom of the, the, um, the index is the, the new virus, which will be something like temporary. But pollution, for example, it decreased uh, almost two years from our life. In Romania, for example, it's even worse that 1.8 years was an average, was a worldwide average. In Romania, from what we know, it's 2.7 years, although nobody has the interest to, to set this, um, this statistic very, very publicly. Um, and also, one uh, in context, um, something that we can we can see as an optimistic uh, point um, that uh, Ursula von der Leyen this summer um, made an, an, an statement that the European uh, European Union intends to reduce the the CO two emissions uh, until the year twenty thirty with uh, up to fifty percent. Uh, a, a bit too optimistic in my opinion because um, uh, the, the, the people and the companies are not very very willing to pay the, the bill for that but as I said at least from the from the political point of view uh, there is a will and I hope that that will be also a starting point for the new uh, for the new exercise regarding European funding from 2021 uh, forward. Uh, 
as I said, we are talking about about uh, two main goals. Um, first of all, uh, would be a society where we can take seriously, and we will apply, and we will reach the level of zero waste, because um, ninety nine point nine percent of everything that we are using can be recycled and or re reused indefinitely. Uh, with, I don't know, a couple of examples that we cannot reuse asbestos or uranium or you name it, but uh, besides that, everything that you, uh, you and I, we are using on daily basis, everything can be reused and uh, we can reach an effective target of zero waste because uh, until a couple of years ago when everybody was talking about zero waste, um, there were there was considering uh, considered as a utopia a nice concept but very hard to uh, to be applied um, so one of the one of the principles is to reduce the consumption of uh, of finite resources through recycling and another branch of of, of reduction uh, of reduction the the consumption of resources would be the reuse because in some cases um, and i was talking about my Mar with marianne a little earlier about uh, about an, an initiative to use uh, use battery cars as uh, storage banks for energy, uh, for for example for um, for solar panels because the main problem with the solar energy that you cannot store it so combining used uh, batteries uh, to store energy and to resell and new, use it later will be a very good idea and in this case um, reusing it's even a better solution than recycle because for example if you reuse a battery you will win almost 40 percent of the energy comparing with the recycling uh, recycling all the all the data that you have um, a second goal that uh, I'm considering is to reach um, a society where we can s not necessarily with green energy because green energy is a concept that it's a kind of tricky from time to time. Not uh, not every renewable can also be called uh, green, but that's a, that will be another discussion because it's very complicated. This is not a topic for today. Um, so through re reuse of the resources and uh, reduction of the energy consumption per unit per car per whatever you want through uh, implementation of the the measures of the with of uh, energy efficiency and also the main point reduction of the conventional uh, resource based energy i mean uh, in replacing coal and nuclear and uh, and oil with everything that uh, that we can find uh, wind uh, hydro geothermal and uh, as george said earlier we can extract so much energy from the sun that uh, much i don't know 100 times or 200 times much more than you can use in one year so um, that will be the two main goals, um, the redu uh, zero waste and sustain sustainable energy based uh, system. Um, and I'll go shortly to two examples that we are working in in, in, uh, in Romania. One is on the micro level and the other is on the, on the larger scale regarding uh, energy and uh, zero waste. Um, the end goal for everybody, and you will see everywhere in the in European Union, uh, the main task is to reduce the CO2 emissions, because based on the study that uh, the Meric the um, the Fraunhof Institute in Germany uh, issued, we the foot the carbon footprint of the average person in 2020 is something like 500 times more than the carbon footprint of the normal individual in 1918, in 19th uh, century in, in Central Europe, for example. So two short scenarios. Uh, we have uh, a wood processing, uh, a wood processing plant uh, in Transylvania, in Dej, in Romania. Uh, before the implementation, we have the classical, uh, classical scenario of take, make, use, dispose and pollute. Uh, they were buying 
the the resources would um, economic uh, technical uh, technical uh, um, uh, processes they were producing wood products uh, furniture and so on and so forth and and uh, and um, as an end result uh, wood waste uh, what uh, was, was produced right they implemented uh, they implemented a um, cogeneration project for some five years ago and uh, the in two steps the first steps was um, they were trying to solve the problem they they had huge amounts of sawdust and at that time no one was using it because no one needed actually there was to, they were giving for free for the employees to use it as a as a heating material in the households and in one point um, a company uh, that wanted intended to produce uh, sawdust briquettes and pellets the small the, the small briquettes that uh, they were starting to to create a market in italy and after that in romania because they were starting to import um, boilers that can the, that uh, that was functioning with briquettes and someone saw the opportunity that instead of uh, laying that to rust and uh, to to be wasted they were using the sawdust to produce briquettes and uh, from my point of view my concern was that comparing with the normal tone of briquettes produced uh, the reduction in energy consumption Per unit proton was uh, was uh, almost sixty percent as uh, as it would be from in a normal in a normal uh, technical process. The second part, the second stage of uh, of the the wood processing plant was that we we helped them implement uh, the cogeneration uh, the cogeneration installation because um, um, someone wanted someone was using a wood waste to uh, to uh, heat the the premises and they were using uh, some kind of um, uh, thermic uh, thermic energy to um, to dry the wood before uh, it uh, enters the the processes and but they had enormous enormous uh, capacity of producing thermic energy and in one point um we installed a one megawatt uh, one megawatt cogeneration uh, installation um they were selling the excess of electrical energy to the grid and they were um, giving they were selling with a with a huge discount the thermic energy to uh, three companies um, located in the vicinity that were using the thermic uh, the thermic energy in the in their natural processes so um in the end um, probably we can say that we reduce actually the the carbon footprint of the company uh company that are uh, they are in a very sensitive uh, area in romania because we had a lot of problem with the wood industry very a large pollution um, and uh, very high, very large problems with the illegal cutting of trees and so on so um we managed to give a very I can say a very good image to a, a company, a very polluting company in a very polluting uh, uh, area. Uh, as I say, we can say probably that we reduced the carbon footprint of the company per year with almost 30%. So that would be at a micro level um, uh, examples of how you can use the, something that you are thrown away to decrease the energy the energy cost and if why not to make also um, a separate business out of that uh, another scenario is that we are uh, we are now in the in the stage of uh, uh, workshops and hopefully we will start to implement from next year uh, we take for example the well, large municipality for example our uh, our hometown uh, Timisoara we have uh, the normal scenario where we have uh, consumption of resources so we are using mainly com conventional energy um, through the utilities uh, offered by the municipality to the people you have a lot of uh, municipal waste so in the 
I can say that is the case of 99.9% .9 of the municipalities in Romania. And our idea in, in, in three or four steps was to um, first to start to uh, solve uh, a smelly problem, if I can say, of the energy sludge that are, is, are the result of, uh, of um, water clearing installations in the city. And we have a huge installation because you have something like 400, 450,000 uh, people living in the city. Um, the first step will be to um, combine the, the, the uh, produce of uh, renewable energy that can use that energy sludge in order to produce electrical energy and if why not thermical energy in order to solve a problem of the pollution and to decrease the energy cost of the mainly the thermic energy cost of the of the municipality. Uh, another uh, another step that we want to we want to proceed is that, uh, for example, we have uh, been a large city. We have a lot of um, of crush materials resulting from the from the road repairs. Uh, that basically we have nothing to do with that. They are just a large large amount of large mountains of uh, of uh, of materials lying there and. Uh, just occupying space. Uh, we intend to combine uh, construction companies, road construction companies that can use that crush materials for road repairs, because basically those crush materials can be used indefinitely uh, in various forms, bitume and uh, concrete and so on and so forth. And uh, we can have something like almost uh, 8,000, 9,000 tons of, uh, of that materials almost, almost each, each season in, uh, in Timisoara. Uh, another issue that uh, we were thinking is to also solve a problem with the tire uh, recycling, because there's also a huge problem. So you, normally tires are just used inside the, the cement factories and it's very polluting. And we want to implement uh, recycling uh, recycling uh, processes that will result in uh, carbon black and diesel, okay, through various uh, through various processes that are uh, implemented in, in other part, other part of the world. Um, because as we have also a big problem with these tires, uh, there is a hundred, three hundred thousand tires, okay, consumed in Timish country each two or three years, and no one is doing anything with that. Um, and also, we are talking about uh, we are talking about um, um, circular economies. And in one point, you can say that you can combine my circular economy with your circular economy, and so on and, and so forth. Because, for example, when you are building scenarios, um, you can create synergies inside of other synergies, and so on and so forth. So, in the, in one point. You can have a huge map where all the circles of everybody is connected with at least two or three others, right? So um, the my our dream, based now on what circular economy is, is that every everybody should be a player in the circular economy, because uh, zero waste is not a utopia. Every, everybody's waste can be someone else's uh, source of energy. So in the end. Um, I don't know if Einstein said or Newton, I'm not quite fond with the physics, but uh, someone says that in this world, in the, our system, nothing should be lost, Everybody, everything uh, should be transformed in one way or other. So, um, I, uh, what I want to, to say that in the end of our scenarios for Timisoara, for example, we can, we will want to reach a zero waste uh, environment and to reach a level where we can decrease the, with 80% the reduction of energy based on, uh, on, uh, on conventional resources. And in the end, we, I extracted some facts, um, how, um, how important the recycle and uh, the, the circular economy is. Because, for example, 
taking in consideration the one of the most expensive commodity that we can have, aluminium. And if you insert aluminium in a circular economy with recycle and reusing, you can save 95% of the energy used, which is huge. I mean, people um, outside our area, when you, where, uh, when you are explaining them about uh, circular economy, they don't in, they don't understand how serious can be because if you tell them that your average coca-cola uh, aluminium can if you if you are using it and you we are uh, coca-cola is making something like 17 billion cans each year imagine what 95 percent of energy savings only in that area of uh, of expertise will mean Okay, so, and also um, if you consider plastics, with, uh, which are a huge problem also in Romania, we are uh, recycling something like less of 3% of the plastic you reuse. Um, for some, uh, reusing and recycling and circular economy is just another headache because there are companies who just wanted to be left alone. But some, for other people like us, circular economy, I think that can be a very interesting business opportunity for the future. So uh, yeah, 21 minutes, I will excuse myself for talking too much, but um, that was the, the, the end of the presentation. So, mm -hmm. uh, if after so much talking, you still uh, want to ask me some question, I will gladly, gladly address to you. Thank you, Catalin. It was really interesting to see the practical side of how to use and reuse materials in order to, yeah, well, reduce energy bill or boost energy capacity. Um, there, there are definitely a couple of questions that I would like to address. And uh, I don't know if you would like to have this poll uh -huh. Yeah, I uh, I almost I did not forgot. Um, I wanted to uh, to um, put uh, to put a poll, but I have no idea what that is because uh, I can do it for you if you if you would like. Yeah, if you can, it will be perfect because I don't know, I have some technical issues here. I don't cannot find the poll. Um, I was asking uh, the participants uh, what they think that is the, the highest uh, consumption of resources within the, the entity, the private or the public entity. Because uh, if you are starting from the highest consumption, um, you can, I'm sure that you, you can always find at least one point where your ent entity can uh, interconnect and overlap with other entities so you can build at least two circles of, uh, of circular economy. Well, it would be great to have some more of uh, our participants of our audience to have their uh, opinion on the poll. But in any way, um, this was a nice representation of how, how different uh, different levels could be addressed. And uh, just to feed you in with the uh, Newton Einstein, it was its, it's first law of thermodynamics was nothing can be used, everything can be just transformed from one to another uh, form. And that's for with the, with the energy. That's uh, kind of a, a conundrum about circular economy, but that's also uh, some of the philosophical questions that we can answer on, on some of the other webinars. And the question that I would like to ask you while this poll is running is, uh, uh, of course, related to Romanian side and to, uh, to energy systems um, as they are. Just a second to scroll back and forth. There are many uh, comments that I that I wrote down and, and questions. Um, so it would be uh, very interesting to see. A second. Let me just see. There is a. Yeah. 
Yeah, it will be, it will be interesting to see how, how companies in Romania are responding to new energy, well, to the energy transition uh, or how similar question to what we had uh, forwarded to Georgia. What is the situation? What are the barriers in Romanian uh, part to transit towards the renewable energy systems? And how the market is developing? Is it that decentralized, centralized, and how is the situation there? Uh, from my own experience, I need to say that I must say that the lobby of uh, of uh, black energy against uh, green energy was huge in Romania and still is. Um, we have a lot of paradox in Romania. We um, we reach uh, two or three years before the limit, the, the rate of 20% of renewable energy, although we have a huge lobby against it because everybody thinks that uh, ah, it's just something that it doesn't work properly, it's very expensive and so on. Um, we have a lot of barriers uh, for pro-consumers, uh, for the people who are consuming and wanted to install the rooftop installation, for example. Uh, on one hand, we have uh, something like 200 hydro, micro, micro hydro plants uh, in project. We have something like, uh, I personally installed something like uh, one, the companies that I work for, uh, we installed something like 1.2, um gigawatt of uh, photovoltaic but on so that's on the plus side on the negative side we are the country with the lowest rate of recycling we are the country with the lowest rate of implementing this circular economy because uh, there are no the for example we have open open pro project that you can apply on uh, for private uh, for private entities or for uh, for municipalities, um, project up to 50 million euros, for example, to use the biomass from the pig farms, to use the biomass from the the energy sludge, for example, in order to produce energy, thermic energy and uh, and electrical energy, uh, with uh, financing for private for public bodies almost up to 98 percent, so almost free money, right? And no one is doing anything because um, uh, the regulation, there are regulations are not are not apply always. Um, and um, as I said, we have a huge, a large lobby against the, the the green energy. And in I must say, unfortunately, I have a lot of clients who wanted to apply to implement energy projects, not because they are convinced of that. But just because they need uh, an image, you know that that that, that uh, the principle of greenwashing. So we are, don't want to be green. We don't want to spend too much money in being green, but we want it to look green. So for a little bit of money, we will invest in some a couple of panels, um, selective recycling and stuff like that. So, uh, but in the end, uh, I I'm still convinced that uh, the private sector will do much more than the, the public sector, because in public sector, you have people that uh, they have no idea what we are talking about this. When you are talking to them about circular economy, they think that is something from other planet. But when you explain them that you, uh, we are collecting old glass uh, on the communi when the communists were so 30 years ago, when we were in school, we had to bring something like 50 or 60 glasses to be recycled each, each month or something like that. So we were playing in a circular economy without even knowing it. Um, so as I said, in Romania, uh, the, we have a lot of paradoxes. The situation is not very, very blue at the time, but um, I'm hoping that uh, besides subsidies for green energy, there will, uh, there will come some subsidies to implement circular economy principles in order to motivate the companies to work one with each other, because that's the main problem. Everybody is secret about the, 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 their own activities. Uh, it's very hard to convince companies to give you the data, how much waste do they produce. So, but as I said, I'm still optimistic on this one.
And Marian on this side can tell you more because he was part of the he was part of the public body and he know much more about uh, about energy than I do, I can say. Right. <laughs> So um, and uh, just short, I will uh, I will answer I will uh, answer to Christina from Constanza Port that uh, they have a lot of possibilities to use the waste, the agricultural waste, in order to produce in cogeneration to produce uh, electricity and uh, and thermic energy. So uh, if everybody is interested, we have a lot of ideas and uh, everybody is free to contact us. All right, thank you very much. Uh, as we are approaching, actually maybe it's already two, it's 1.59, I would uh, briefly uh, raise this question uh, uh, about uh, incineration and have a very short one sentence closing remark of uh, what is good about incineration and where are the risks <laughs> if that can be put in one one sentence and so okay what is the good good uh, good side of the incineration in when we talk about our region and our situation in regards to circular economy and what is one of the biggest risks that incineration as it is poses to our to our region Starting, let's try to start from uh, from Catalin and then we'll move backwards. Uh, incineration, uh, to answer the second question, uh, I don't think that poses too many risks because there is uh, there are a lot of technology filters and so on. So the risk for, uh, for public health is minimum because uh, you get much more CO2 for burning wood, for example, from burning tires, okay, without any control. So I don't think that there are too many risks uh, with these new technologies. And incineration, uh, we have a word, for example, in Romania, we are wasting waste, we are not using waste. And in Italy, a couple of years ago, the mafioso in Milano and Torino, they were fighting for for controlling the zones for collecting the waste so because they are they were doing they were making money from uh, burning the waste and producing energy okay and uh, we are just having piles of uh, piles of landfills okay um, and we are doing nothing with that and uh, i don't know if or we have a huge scandal in timish because uh, uh, an ecological landfill that was supposed to be ecological um, they discovered that uh, they were uh, they were spilling millions of liters of uh, of uh, very toxic water into the river of Timish. So um, incineration is is a very good thing, and it will be a, a lot of pluses and almost almost no uh, no disadvantage. Because as I said, we have enough filters that you can filter almost anything in this world. Okay, thank you. Um, let's go to Georgie. Your thanks, uh, thanks Milo for, for this question. I'm not an expert in, in this area and thanks, thanks to Kat, thank, thank you Kathleen for bringing this uh, information. This is like completely new for me. Okay, if it can be uh, developed uh, in a healthy way, uh, I'm totally okay with that. And uh, uh, I, will, I will tell, uh, Talk as a citizen right now here in Belgrade, we have a really big, uh, uh, big plan uh, for uh, for uh, incineration or burning waste uh, to, to to energy. But uh, what is what what is basically the the issue with with that? Uh, the government or city authorities announced that uh, we citizens will basically pay. Uh, our uh, garbage collection duty much more because of that uh, new new factory for burning waste. So I think uh, it's, it's completely stupid way to uh, insert uh, environmentally friendly project. Uh, yeah, the company which will run that factory will uh, earn a lot of money 
and now in order i think that it should be even uh, for citizens to get uh, how to say to support that project the price for the collection of garbage need to be made need to be lower not not uh, <laughs> not more expensive so that's something what what i don't understand here and once again thanks thank, thank you Katalin, for uh, uh, clearing this uh, uh doubts about uh, about uh, health protection in these projects I, I didn't know that they can be created safely thank you george uh, uh, lydia would you like to or do you have anything to compliment to add hey hey thank you no i don't have anything to add i think uh, that we're over time so maybe our participants uh, will have other commitments thank you and uh, uh, well well i'm asking marianne also to to have a closing word on this question i would uh, just kindly ask the participants to give us as much as possible answers on the feedbacks they will be very quick uh three questions they will help, help us greatly uh in making even better webinars in the future which will come definitely so uh, thank you for this also and marian please let us know what is your thinking about incineration and, and opportunities and risks uh, yes uh, i will be straightforward i do not totally agree with incineration because it is a down cycling method it means that uh, the value and I'm not talking about the financial value, but the general value of the, uh, of the, of the materials uh, get down, uh, gets down. And uh, there are some other means to use the value up to the point where you cannot use it anymore and you have to appeal to the incineration. And I will give you some examples. So, for uh, you, you have to extract the gold from the electronic control units prior to burning them. Uh, there are a lot of contacts in the electronics that, that are uh, uh, rare uh, metals and they have to be extracted and revalorized. Yes, if you burn them, then you lose them forever. And uh, as I told uh, in my presentation, there are some uh, methods uh, alternative methods that should be used, uh, for example, substance cascading. An example in this sense is to, uh, for example, to uh, use the industrial industrial wastewater for other purposes. If it is a, an, a clean or green industrial wastewater, it should be used, it could be used in the agriculture. For example, or if uh, I, I I can tell you that uh, uh, in the brewery sector, the waste, the spent grain, could be used to extract methane, which could be used further for other purposes, not only for burning and uh, uh, producing electricity and heat. So, from my point of view, this uh, downcycling should be made on steps gradually and only as as last resort we should burn things out this is my own perspective of course there are some uh, opportunities uh, with uh, the incinerations but they are only immediate uh, immediate uh, opportunities not on the long run this is my own perspective Okay. Thank you very much, Marianne. Uh, I would like to also give my own impression about the topic of incineration and uh, if we are including new technologies, then we will alleviate risks that are posing. And one of the major risks uh, is technological lockdown, which means that if we are creating any kind of an energy, any kind of a bigger plan, we're pretty much locked in technology in, in the, for the future. And for these kind of technologies, it's usually, uh, we usually need uh, 15 to 25 years. So they are paid off. So we need to be consciously conscious enough and aware that we have to 
feed this system for the next 15 to 25 years in order for this to work and to be uh, justifiable at the end of its like life cycle. However, it is the, uh, one of the one of the ways that uh, we can solve two two hits in oh sorry two flights in one hit, which is waste and uh, energy energy sourcing. With uh, and 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 that comes with. Uh, um fairly lower prices than the uh, than other um, renewable energy so uh from my perspective and from my um view that the uh, clean and new tech um, incinerators could be a transition method towards circular economy but as marian has also said we really need to take care is uh, of what are the effects on the lo long run on the long term and how much how long are we going to be um, in this field of in between the linear and circular economy when we will need and when the also the trends and the policies and and, and markets will push us towards the uh, towards uh, greener solutions and one of the famous uh, uh, one of the famous examples is the northern countries of, of uh, Denmark and Sweden where uh, where uh, at one point there was a raised discussion of how can we go out of this lock-in because the, back in the days this was an amazing solution but now when we have push from other energies there uh, there are issues to be uh, to be transferred or to be passed over in order to go to wind for instance in Denmark or even more to, to solar okay not in Denmark and Sweden definitely not, not solar but uh, but wind definitely so these these are some closing remarks from my side Thank you very much for uh, giving us all the answers and the time. We're breaking our our uh, uh, timeline uh, for 10 minutes now. There is the last poll that I would most kindly ask our participants to, to answer. And um, uh, I would like also to announce the next webinar that will uh, be held uh, next month. Um, under the topic of uh, green or circular procurement systems, uh, more, this is more and more hot topic, um, and we would like to continue conversation over this and many other topics. At the end, um, visit our site if there are uh, if there are also um, interest to be to to get in touch with us. Uh, there are all informations and information in regards to how to get in touch and how can we help uh, you in the path of circular transition on our site, which is. Uh, circular-beacons.net. Once again, thank you very much for participating and thank you very much for sharing your expertise, time and knowledge. Until next time, I wish you a very good and successful day. Thank you all. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. And Adriana, you can play the music. <laughs>